Rescue Boat 1 respond to Kettle Creek State Park for two kayaks overturned on the lake, one adult, one child in the water. Boat 1 is on scene. All right, we just responded to a call of two kayaks that capsize out in the lake. Now is not the time to think about rescue boat outfitting. So that's what we're here to do today. We're gonna to show you how to go ahead, inflate your boat, outfit it with the proper materials and supplies, and get it ready to enact a rescue. So Ryan, today we're gonna to talk about buying and outfitting a rescue boat. What are some of the primary things we need to know? All right, first off, let's just take a step back. Before you go out and purchase a rescue boat for your department, you wanna take a couple things into account. One, the authority having jurisdiction. What type of district are they covering? What type of water? what type of boat. A lot of different makes, models, manufacturers, styles of boats, which we'll talk about. So you need to figure that out first. The next is to what level of training that authority having jurisdiction wants to train uh, their operators to. So it's to train at a level they expect to work in. Yes. So that's going to be the number one step before you actually go out and buy a rescue boat. And what's the name of the course offered by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission? Emergency Boat Operations and Rescue. It's a 16 hour, two day course, and it goes over primarily swift water, inflatable style boats. What kind of boats are available to rescue personnel? Well, again, a lot of different styles. So you have you know aluminum John boats for a flood management application, and then you have inflatable style boats, which is what we're gonna cover today. So when it comes to inflatables, various sizes, you have a 380 style, uh, which is about you know, 11 and a half, 12 foot boat, all the way up to typically the, the largest inflatable that you'll see for uh, swift water rescue application might be a 470, so we're talking you know, 15 and a half foot inflatable boat. Another thing to keep in mind is that there's a lot of different manufacturers out there and a lot of different materials used to put uh, inflatable boats together. So they could be a, a PVC style or they could be you know, a, a Hypalon and it's gonna be a cost difference with that and also durability is gonna come with that as well. So you wanna do your research before you go out and purchase a boat and again, having some type of formal training beforehand is gonna make you uh, being able to make a better decision on that side of it. Well, let's open this up and see what we've got. Sounds great. So obviously, Ryan, this is a new boat that's never been deployed before. Yeah, it is. So again, perfect application why you want to have your boat outfitted before responding to a call. And this happened to be a boat in the bag, so it is bundled up in the back of a trailer. So you want to make sure that you go ahead and get these things blown up and properly operational before you respond. In addition, you can see, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, this has an inflatable floor. All right. So there's also hard floor models of inflatable boats. So again, depending on what your application is, is going to dictate what your department, agency, organization purchases. Obviously there's many ways to inflate our, our boat there, Ryan. So let's go through some of the methods. Yeah. So you see here sitting on the ground, we have SCBA bottle that has an inflation hose connected to it. We have the foot pump that typically actually comes with an inflatable boat when you purchase it. We also have a blower that works well. The only drawback to that is that you have to have electricity, a generator, power inverter, something to run it, as well as a barrel pump. So again, bunch of different manufacturers, styles that are out there. One of the key things when you inflate a boat is you want to inflate it until the blow off valves start to hit, until they come out. That way the tubes are fully inflated. One of the common problems with uh, individuals inflating boats is that the boats are underflated. So we want to make sure that we inflate them up to their proper uh, PSI per manufacturer. You can do that with the blow-off valves. Also, a PSI gauge specific for inflatable boats, so you can actually go around and test the pressure. In addition, boats have keels on them, and some inflatable floors don't have a blow-off valve. So we don't want to utilize an SCBA to inflate those, because we can actually over-inflate them and uh, damage can occur or the, a seam could blow out. So you want to use some type of barrel pump or a foot pump to inflate the keel or inflatable floor if they don't have a blow off valve. What are the hazards when the keel or the floor is underinflated? Well, that boat's going to cavitate a lot, especially once you get a motor hanging on it and it's not going to perform up to standard as well as if your keel deflates, uh, if you're out there but has speed tubes or just a keel underneath the boat, it could actually underperform and not actually give you the cornering and turning that you might need in a true whitewater, swift water environment. 
So obviously you're already in a hazardous condition. You want your boat to perform at its best. Yes, absolutely you do. Okay, now we're going to talk about inflation of the boat. Okay, there's a lot of different types of manufacturers out there. This one happens to have valves in each chamber. Some other manufacturers out there utilize a, a combined system where you can actually open up the valves and it allow air to fill the entire boat at once. But we're going to go over these specifically. One of the things with these valves is you have to make sure that they're turned correctly. So I'm going to show you if you push in and turn it, you can hear it deflating, okay? So you need to make sure that the inside valve is turned correctly so then you can fill it. That's how you deflate the boat. And again, whenever you're utilizing whatever method to uh, inflate the boat, this is your blow-off valve. So you want to inflate it until this valve blows. Some things to keep in mind that if you're in cold weather, cold water below freezing, these can actually ice up. So you have to be cognizant of that. Make sure this stuff stays free. Otherwise, you may overinflate your boat and cause a tear or seam the leak. And again, always go back to the time-tested just PSI gauge, okay? Once your boat has air in it, you can go and double check it with this PSI gauge. You just push it right in, and right there, after we deflated it, we're at about 0.8 PSI. Most boats require 3 PSI, so this uh, chamber is going to need a little bit more air. Ryan, what happens back here at the transom if these tubes are underinflated? That's a great point, bud. So if the tubes are underinflated, it puts undue stress on this transom and these transom seals, and you can actually have a catastrophic failure. So that's why it's key to utilize that PSI gauge and blow these tubes up per manufacturer's guidelines. All right, so it's winter time, and my boat's in my nice warm apparatus bay, and we get a cold water call and we pull out of the warm bay into the cold air. What's gonna happen to my boat? Well, that's just the laws of physics, bud. So if you come in from a warm bay going out to a cold environment, you're gonna lose air pressure. So it's always key, depending on the manufacturer of the boat, they may have an SCBA cylinder connected inside. If not, you're gonna to have to make sure that you bring one out to your call for sure, because you're gonna to need to top that boat off once you hit it in the water, because it's going to deflate, and we don't wanna have underinflated tubes. So tell me about the weight of the capacity plate. Okay, so the capacity plates right here, it's gonna be on all types of manufactured boats. So on this specific boat, you know, we're at a 12 and a half foot boat, 380 style. It's saying that we can hold five people or 1,750 pounds. So that's something to take into consideration. If you're going out on a rescue mission, you have rescue personnel and PPE as well as equipment. You want to make sure that you're not loading this boat with four rescuers and equipment because then you may only be able to get one victim. So depending on the mission scope, you may only want to have a bowman and an operator and some equipment so that way you can affect more rescues and get more people into your boat. It also has the engine horsepower capacity and the weight of the engine that this transom can hold. And while we're talking about transoms, one of the things to keep in mind when you're mounting the outboard motor here on the transom plate is that once we have that motor mounted secured tightly you want to take a piece of webbing or prusik and utilize these eyelets and tie that motor to the transom so in the case it were to fall off you're not going to lose the entire motor it'll be hung on by uh, rope or webbing and we use rope or webbing and not chains or cables so then we can cut it if we need to Okay, bud, now that we have the boat inflated, we checked it with our PSI gauge. We'll go around, put the covers on all the inflation points, and now just gonna touch base on a couple items on the boat before we get into what type of equipment we're gonna outfit the rescue boat with. All right, so we're gonna go down here. This manufacturer has a drain plug. Up, keeps it open, down, closes it. Other manufacturers actually have big scupper valves and they'll have a sock on the back of the transom. So you lower that down if you're starting to get a lot of water in or if it's raining, it'll help draw all that water out. A couple other things just with this boat, once we get it up and going, we have the eyelets, the attachment points to put the motor on. Going around this boat here, you also see a lot of the D-rings, which is nice. You can attach um, bags on there, flip lines, several other different types of equipment and keep it in the boat. So in the case of a capsize, it's gonna stay with the boat. 
And then in a little bit, we're gonna show you, we're gonna attach a bow bag up front that's actually gonna house all of our loose equipment to keep it out of the way while we're actually in the effect of a rescue or doing training and operating the boat. So let's look at the equipment we're gonna put in this boat. Okay, so now we have a bunch of equipment that we've compiled together and it's all gonna be mission specific of what your actual AHJ calls for. So first things first, we wanna have some type of throwable device, whether that be a seat cushion or a ring buoy, something that we can throw to a victim in the water for a hasty rescue. Other things we have, we have adult size PFD or life jacket that we wanna make sure that we affix to the victim before we move them from an inherently safe location. We also have infant and or youth life jackets because we're not sure what the mission is gonna bring us. A helmet that we can also provide to the victim. A throw bag, all right? So throw bag's gonna be utilized. It also has additional poly pro rope in here that we might find useful out on the water. Then we get to our anchor. This is a collapsible anchor. It attaches right to the bow of the boat, very compact, and it's great for an inflatable style boat. If you're gonna utilize uh, a larger boat, you might wanna think about a slightly larger anchor or different style of anchor. Then we have our spare fuel lines. If you think back to our boat motor maintenance video, these typically do go bad, and sometimes if they go bad while you're out on the water, it's nice to have an extra spare that you can change right out. Now, we'll have a rollerboard net, all right? So you fix this to the side of the vessel, and you can roll somebody that's inhabilitated up into your boat. Makes it a little bit easier. Then we have a foot pump. So if we lose air, we had talked about going from a warm environment in a uh, station out into a cold water call, we might need to top off our boat if we're out there for a couple hours and we lose some air. So we have the foot pump. Then we just have the manufacturer's patch kit that we bring along. Maybe not necessarily something that you're gonna do out on the water, but it is nice to have in the case you have to do a patch along the shoreline or at a launch or access ramp. You wanna have an emergency blanket and then also a small first aid kit. All right, make sure that your first aid kit is possibly in a dry bag. Uh, first aid kits are being sold. Some of them are actually um, water resistant and come in a dry bag. Nice little kit that you can put in your, uh, in your rescue boat. Is a marker buoy. Again, remember, last known point, point last seen. They're gonna make or break a rescue effort. So to make sure that you have that cash and easily accessible. A bilge pump. These actually work very well, so if for some reason your scuppers are clogged up with debris or ice, water's coming in fast, you can just pull this out and dewater your boat. We also have tow bridles, all right? Because we all know a lot of our rescue calls, at least in some of the uh, larger navigable waters, usually involve a disabled boat that we might need to tow them to shore or tow them to some certain location. Now we have some visual distress signals, again, Utilize these per manufacturer's guidelines. If you are gonna use something uh, that's combustible, make sure that you're lighting it and setting off the flare downwind of your fuel tank and your engine. We also have GPS. This goes hand in hand with that marker buoy that we had in there, so you wanna make sure you have GPS to utilize. We also have uh, some night vision or image intensifiers if we have to do work at night. And then we have Silum sticks, all right? red and green that we can affix to the bow of our boat to keep in compliance with navigation lights and then usually a white one or a yellow light if you can have it as well for for caution and or an all-around light all right so then we just have a roll of duct tape here so it's cut down just has a bolt through it here just to conserve space instead of a whole big roll of duct tape but duct tape comes in handy then we have a little saw uh, for brush in case we get into an area that has a lot of limbs flooded out uh, suburban and or rural areas. That'll come in handy. And then again, we just have some other basic boat maintenance stuff. Some spark plugs, um, some rope, some line. Okay, now that we've shown you all that equipment, something to keep in mind is to make sure if you have any electronics, flashlights, GPS, uh, night vision, image intensifiers, make sure that you have that stored in a dry bag or a dry box and have spare batteries. Uh, to try to keep that away from moisture as much as possible. Next thing here is the paddles. These are breakdown paddles. Each manufacturer typically sells an inflatable boat or have some breakdown paddles. And these are nice and handy because you can stow them easily. 
but some of the things, uh, pros and cons, is that you might just want to go ahead and get yourself a couple good quality paddles that are going to stand up because sometimes paddles that are just uh, collapsible in a, in a high hazard environment, they actually tend to break or snap and they're not made to the same standards as a typical uh, paddling style paddle. And that looks like we're about it. Everything fit in our bow bag. Now we're gonna go ahead and show you how to affix it on the boat and we'll be ready for the water. It sits in there pretty good, bud, doesn't it? Very nice. You can either attach your bow bag with these plastic hooks or you can use the strap method up here where you actually bring the strap through and pass it back through the buckle. And everything we showed fits right in this bag. Let's talk about the flip lines we have attached to the boat. Okay. Yeah, the flip lines, they attach right here. It's uh, pretty nice on this boat. There's D-rings on there. So depending on how the boat's manufactured, you might have a couple different attachment points. But the flip lines here, we have polypro rope here in the bag. And these are going to be utilized in the case of the boat capsizing or flipping over and then you have to write it up. Another thing that you can utilize if you need to, you can get a little piece of webbing exactly what you have right there and you can do the same thing with a piece of webbing as you can with these flip lines. All right, so exactly like you're showing right there. Just and the that girth hitch very well. the length of webbing. Yeah, and you can even use that as a par buckling technique. If you didn't have that rollerboard net that we talked about earlier, you can have somebody go ahead and get them right in the boat. All right, bud, so now we showed how to go about inflating the boat, different methods of that, doing all your checks with the PSI gauge, outfitting the boat, utilizing the bow bag to put all of our supplies in. We talked about paddles briefly, the flip lines, the webbing, how to attach your motor on the back and utilize a piece of webbing or prusik to attach the motor to the transom, okay? A couple other things that we want to make mention of, all boats are different, okay? So if you have a couple different styles of boats at your station, department, organization, you wanna make sure that they're numbered in some way. So you could have a number on your bow bag with all that equipment cached in there, as well as a number on your boat, just so it's easily identifiable. You also wanna think about having some type of marking on the top of your outboard motor. So that way, if there's any aircraft involved in the rescue or search, they can identify each boat. So, so that way, um, everybody's on the common page when it comes to operations. The time to outfit your boat is not during the time of an incident. We want to do that and stress some pre-planning and having checklists for each one of your craft equipment, have equipment inventories that are checked regularly to make sure that when you do go out on a rescue call, you have all the equipment needed to affect that rescue efficiently. To my fellow rescuers out there, again, it's important everyone remains safe in what you do. Don't wait till the last minute. Make sure you have everything prepared before the incident, not wait till the incident occurs to get your equipment ready. 